Hey guys, I'm going to start off by apologizing in advance for the length of this video. It's quite long because I have a lot to cover. And also, please pardon my voice, I'm getting over a nasty cold. This is going to be another response to Hey Ruka, and very likely the last. Hi sweetheart, it's me again. Having watched your last video, I realized that you don't fully watch all video responses made to you but I strongly urge you to ride this one out. You made a video response to Zoh My God It's Chris called Zan Gets a Social Construct. And I have to say, I love how you start off with this. Hi YouTube and hi Chris, I don't expect you to watch this, but that's okay. Five seconds in and already the dishonesty comes flying out. W what was that? Some ploy to make yourself look like the sympathetic underdog? The fact that Chris responded to you in the first place doesn't jive with your not-so-subtle implication that she's too stuck up to watch videos made by all you common folk. I pick up on things like that. So, getting started, much of your video completely betrays your tendency to sift through and cherry-pick whatever publications you can find to corroborate your worldview, and that's a bad sign for you. You would have had to consciously skip over all the sources and data that provide concrete, detailed evidence and conclusions that are completely contrary to what you want to see. And that's the problem with people like you. When you have such a stranglehold agenda that conflicts with the scientific consensus, it's inevitable that you're going to resort to all-out deception and fact-twisting, just like creationists and your average run-of-the-mill conspiracy theorists. In between all that were misplaced filler rants against cultural diversity, which nobody was even talking about, and accusing Chris of promising peace through said diversity, which she never did. Ruka, you have admitted to being lazy with providing sources, but apparently you're even too lazy to watch an entire video before responding to it. I will say one thing on the subject of cultural diversity, though. In my own personal experience, only those who have little to no discernible culture of their own are the ones most likely to feel threatened by outside influences. You mentioned to me in your comments that people should not take pride in things that are not a direct result of their own actions. This is baseless and it's unfounded. People can take pride in many things, anything that gives them a sense of value or that contributes to their worth as a human. This includes things like school pride, family pride, being proud of your children's achievements, and last but not least, racial pride. Nice try, sweetheart. The problem with your analogies is that none of them equate with so-called racial pride. Taking pride in one's school, family, or children's accomplishment all involve one's own direct participation. For example, if you're raising a child and that child accomplishes something noteworthy, then it would naturally follow that that accomplishment is a result of your direct influence. Taking pride in something that is completely out of your control and irrelevant to who you are, such as your very recent ethnic background, is just pathetic. It indicates a lack of personal accomplishments and a sick, undeserved sense of entitlement based solely on what you and your parents happen to look like. So I'll just ask everyone, why do you place yourself in the interest of a mixed race nation? Obviously it's because we're, that's where we're at right now and we need to deal with it. Prejudice based on skin color is not something that I practice nor is it something I advocate. Race is not skin color. Skin color is not race. Seeing race does not make one racist. True. Being racist means that Differences in behavior and capacity within a group of people is based largely, if not entirely, on their ethnic background. Now, if you want to make the claim that wanting to live in a society where there are no brown people does not make you racist, good luck with that. I did notice that you have an easier time explaining what race isn't rather than what it is. And as far as I've seen, when it comes to actually defining what you think a race is, this is all we've ever gotten out of you. How I define race is irrelevant, but I go by a very widely accepted definition of race. That is that race is essential, well it is, um, variation. It is genetic uh, allele frequency, genetic clustering, and heritability, um, 
applies to groups of people and for all intents and purposes that defines race. It has to do with proportions and patterns and um, placement and expression. Thanks for clearing that up. However, the statistics suggest otherwise. Ethnically and racially homogeneous regions tend to be more peaceful, whereas heterogeneous regions tend to have higher crime rates. The recently released U.S. Peace Index of 2011 ranked the 50 U.S. states by their levels of peace. Lighter states ranked as more peaceful, darker states as less peaceful. It takes a special brand of unscrupulous lowlife to purposely distort data from the Institute of Economics and Peace to make a bullshit correlation between peace and ethnically homogenous communities, especially when that data provided says absolutely nothing about race or ethnicity. In fact, it specifically states that, quote, peace is significantly correlated with factors related to economic opportunity, education, and health, and that New York, California, and Texas, three states which contain some of the highest minority populations in the country, have seen record increases in peace. Much of the declines stated have been attributed to a rise in number of incarcerations and police presence, and a strong correlation with high poverty rates. Seriously, sweetheart, it would behoove you to actually read the words underneath the pretty pictures next time. You asserted in your video that scientists have stopped using the word race. This is fallacious. Race is still a valued taxonomy by many scientists and is found in scientific literature. The fact that you erroneously claimed this betrays your ignorance on the topic. And the fact that you misquoted Chris betrays your dishonesty on the subject. She didn't say that scientists have stopped using the word race altogether. She said that scientists have stopped using the word race in the context you were using it, in reference to human biology and genetics. And for the most part, they have. You even cited one of the same sources I used in my first video of the two anthropologists' rejection and acceptance of the term race in reference to the various human populations. Interestingly enough, the only other link of the supposed various views of anthropologists that you linked was from a free blog site that doesn't even have any viewable entries. Hmm, is that all you could find of the various views of anthropologists on the subject of race? That's okay. I really couldn't find any either. What I did find was a steady consensus among anthropologists that the concept of race, as most lay people understand it, as having little to no basis in the realm of human taxonomy. The terms race and populations are often interchangeable. Scientists exchanging the word race for population does not necessarily mean that they disagree with the concept of race. The reason that anthropologists have replaced the word race in reference to human classification with terms like ethnicity and population is because it has become evident that the term was incorrect in the first place. That's how science works. When new information is presented, conclusions change. You asserted that scientists no longer acknowledge race as a biological category. Again, this is fallacious because no such consensus exists in the scientific community. There is a multiplicity of studies indicating that not only is there no consensus, but that an increasing number of scientists agree with the following statement. There are biological races in the species Homo sapiens. Increasing amount my ass. That survey was conducted in 1985. Fourteen years later, the percentages of those who agreed with that statement considerably dropped. And since then, the results of the mapping of the human genome have been made public. So take a guess as to how many people agree with that statement now. Now, you either took that information straight from Wikipedia, or you linked off one of the sources they cited, which would be this. In which case, you would have ignored all the other slides that show a consistent pattern of the concept of race falling out of favor with anthropologists. And the very next slide of that source that displays the results of the survey you cited links to the Understanding Race Project of the American Anthropological Association. Their definition of race is this. Race, a recent idea created by Western Europeans following exploration across the world to account for differences among people and justify colonization, conquest, enslavement, and social hierarchy among humans. The term is used to refer to groupings of people according to common origin or background and associated with perceived biological markers. Among humans, there are no races except the human race. 
In biology, the term has limited use, usually associated with organisms or populations they're able to interbreed. Ideas about race are culturally and socially transmitted and form the basis of racism, racial classification, and often complex racial identities. In keeping with that, the source you did link for this incredibly dishonest representation of an obsolete survey was this 2001 article which describes it more in depth. Having gone through it, I have to wonder why you would use this article as your source of reference. But then I remembered, you're lazy. You even admitted it. Since you clearly didn't bother reading the source you listed, I'll go ahead and read it for you. Klein's provided a concrete alternative to thinking in terms of race. Identifiable traits were not confined to one race and were not uniform in frequency within a geographic area. C. Loring Brace made a persuasive case for studying human clinal variation one trait at a time. The new views were intensely debated in anthropology beginning in the 1960s, and by 1985, anthropology's core concept of race had been rejected by 41% of physical anthropologists and 55% of cultural anthropologists. A similar survey in 1999 found that the concept of race was rejected by 69% of physical anthropologists and 80% of cultural anthropologists. During the period 1975 to 1979, twice as many university textbooks of introductory physical anthropology rejected the concept as accepted it. And during the period 1990 to 1999, no text explicitly supported the concept. So you see, Ruka, the reference you cited wasn't backing up your claim. It was refuting it. You concluded that race is a social construct. The problem with this is that race is a biological phenomenon, not a social phenomenon. Race has its basis in biology. Social constructs are concepts of the mind and are agreed upon to some extent by society. Race is not determined socially and it is validated outside of any social context. Common observable phenotypes among populations are explained by genetics, not society. Believing that race is a social construct does not make it so, nor does it undermine its validity. Your fallacy was implying that a social construct cannot also be a reality. That race is biologically valid and does not need the validation of society. The word itself encompasses a socially agreed upon set of rules that are useful to society as a vague identifier of human categories. Skin color is both a phenotype and a superficial construct. Culture is not skin color. Race cannot be explained in terms of factors like culture because race is biological. But there are distinctions beyond skin color, such as bone density, height, body build, skull shape and size, hormones, hair thickness and straightness, hard tissue and soft tissue traits, behavior and intelligence. There are phenotypes associated with race. These are physiological characteristics explainable by genetics. The divergence of humans out of Africa as far back as 100,000 years or even 10,000 years ago is time enough for evolution to shape drastic differences distinct to racial groups. And here you're citing this pile of shit, authored by J.P. Rushton that you linked, which, much like many of your other sources, has already been debunked. In this case, by Leonard Lieberman, a professor of anthropology at Central Michigan University. Rushton avoids the necessity of explaining the many cases that do not fit his principle of aggregation by using the socially constructed 19th century typology of races. He counters the view that race is merely a social construct by referring to the work of, quote, forensic anthropologists able to classify skulls by race, who reported that narrow nasal passages mark a caucasoid, wider based openings a negroid, distinct cheekbones a mongoloid. His crude classification belies century of interbreeding in the United States. Studies of some black populations have demonstrated that 25 to 30 percent of their blood group genes are of European origin. The forensic anthropologists Stephen Ousley and Richard Jan stated that, quote, social race is assigned based on phenotypes, which in the U.S. appear largely based on skin color. In the United States, those who are part African in ancestry have been classified and are expected to classify themselves as black. The result, referred to above, has been an increasing proportion of European ancestry among African Americans, a pattern that makes cranial and IQ measurements of dubious meaning when applied to a race. This is a pretty obvious factor that people like you keep overlooking. What you call race is essentially useless in terms of human taxonomy because of all the interbreeding that has gone on for the past several centuries. 
Yes, the initial geographic separations of populations produce the evolutionary changes that created these phenotypes in the first place. But we simply weren't limited in this way long enough to produce enough changes that would have created substantial genetic divergences. And if that just burns up you and your white supremacist friends, you have only the Europeans to blame. They're the ones who decided to colonize the entire world. And wherever they went, they made it a habit of boning the natives. Even American black people who descend from African slaves have at least a quarter of their recent ancestry hailing from Europe. So these phenotypes that would have been unique to just one human population are now found in many, rendering the idea of race in humans to be obsolete, as are the old world representations of the supposed races. I mean, what the hell is this? Which white pride website did you pull this from? Because I have a hard time believing that any legitimate source of anthropology would display so monkeyish a face to represent people of recent sub-Saharan ancestry. But I digress. Do you know where this refutation of Rushton's research can be found? You should, Ruka. It's the same article that you mindlessly linked in your description box, believing that it backed up a 25-year-old survey. Again, your own source refuted you. As I said in my previous video, it pays to do your homework when citing someone as a source. J.P. Rushton is another professor of psychology trying to resurrect primitive ideas, just like your role dog Arthur Jensen. You cited Jensen in your earlier videos, one who was being funded by the racist organization the Pioneer Fund, which spearheaded the dubious research that was later used in the bell curve. J.P. Rushton is the current president of the Pioneer Fund, whose work has been universally panned by actual biologists and anthropologists worldwide, who don't take kindly to a couple of hacks with racial superiority ridden agendas perverting their life's work. If you're wondering why I keep reminding you of their affiliation with the Pioneer Fund, the reason should be quite obvious. Results of research that is funded by an organization with a very clear agenda of white superiority, scrutiny is a must. Especially when these so-called researchers start publishing documents on fields of science that they do not have specialties in, and that which conflicts with all the body of DNA and paleoanthropological evidence of the last 50 years. The evolution of humans in different environments was a process of adaptation which gave rise to different geographical populations having different phenotypical traits and genetic variation. You mentioned dogs and artificial selection. While you are correct regarding this, you also implied that the breakdown of geographical barriers also breaks down the concept of race because races are no longer confined to regions of the world. This is another erroneous assertion. Geographical confinement and separation are not criteria for a subspecial category. Well, that's funny because according to Wikipedia, biologyonline.org, and every single dictionary site I've seen lists geographic factors as criteria for subspecies. Anthropologists don't always agree on which human species were completely distinct from us and which of those would be considered as a subspecies. But in regards to all living people today, there is no question. DNA and the human genome have already proved that all living humans belong to the same subspecies, Homo sapiens sapiens. This is yet another reason why the term race is largely incorrect in use with human taxonomy, as in biology is used interchangeably with species. Of course, there are legitimate arguments that have been put forth for its continued use in regarding to classifying humans. As you cited with the dubious link title, Race is Still a Valued Taxonomy, the book The Ancestor's Tale, A Pilgrimage to the Dawn of Evolution by Richard Dawkins and Yan Wang put forth such an argument. We can happily agree that human racial classification is of no social value and is positively destructive of social and human relations. That is one reason why I object to ticking boxes and forms and why I object to positive discrimination in job selection. But that doesn't mean that race is of virtually no genetic or taxonomic significance. However small the racial partition of the total variation may be, if such racial characteristics as there are highly correlated with other racial characteristics, they are by definition informative, and therefore of taxonomic significance. It takes a certain amount of desperation to use this book as a reference to race being a valued taxonomy. 
Dawkins and Wong specifically state that race has no social value, which is at odds with your claims and is toxic to human relations. At any rate, what they're saying is that they're willing to accept the taxonomic significance of race simply because certain characteristics usually correlate with others. They also acknowledge that in human biology, the term race is not clearly defined because of the fact that human races are obviously not subspecies. In the next few passages, they make their opinions clear as to why people continue to struggle with the understanding, and it isn't biological. They make no implication regarding behavior, intelligence, or anything along the lines of subspecies. In fact, in the same book that you listed as a source, they dismiss the definition of human races being synonymous with subspecies because they clearly don't fit the criteria. Whatever we may think as observers to superficial appearances, the human species today is, to a geneticist, especially uniform. Taking such genetic variation as the human population does possess, we can measure the fraction that is associated with the regional groupings that we call race, and it turns out to be a small percentage of the total, between 6 and 15 percent depending on how you measure it, much smaller than in many other species where races have been distinguished. Geneticists conclude, therefore, that race is not a very important aspect of a person. There are other ways to say this. If all humans were wiped out except for one local race, the great majority of the genetic variation in the human species would be preserved. This is not intuitively obvious and may be quite surprising to some people. If racial statements were as informative as most Victorians, for example, used to think, you would surely need to preserve a good spread of all the different races in order to preserve most of the variation in the human species. Yet, this is not the case. So Dawkins and Juan made it crystal clear that even if they're willing to accept the concept of race and taxonomy, it is certainly not in the context that you are referring to, and they wholly reject the implications made by people like you. Once again, your own source refutes your claim. And by now, I think I've made my point. Viewers, the link to the original video is in the description box. Please feel free to watch the video in full. Ruka. This 11-minute pile of horse manure is one of the most mind-spinning displays of quote mining I've ever seen. Not only is it overwhelmingly obvious that you didn't even read your own sources, I'm also inclined to believe that you committed one of the ultimate taboos in written and video journalism, searching exact phrases of positions that you already hold, and then not bothering to confirm if the sources they derive from are even in your favor. It takes enormous testes to put out a video like that. I mean, did you really think nobody was going to check your links? Hell, I'm lazy too, but that doesn't stop me from painstakingly going through this putrid mess, pain being the operative word here. Either you didn't write the script and just mindlessly read off someone else's work without caring enough about your own credibility to fact check it first, or you did write this script and just inserted passages so incredibly out of context from articles and books that you didn't bother to read. You're all probably wondering why I take on this nouveau racism. As I said in my previous video, I find it insulting, and not just for the obvious reasons. Twisting disparate facts to force them in line with a sick ideology and presenting primitive 19th century political correctness under the facade of harmlessness are not innocent. Impressionable people watch shit like this and have their thinking warped, erroneously believing that this seemingly non-hostile racism is backed by science. But nice racism is still just plain old racism. No matter how calm or diminutive they may appear, racists are and always have been lying, science-perverting scumbags, and none of you so-called racial realist types have proven to be any different. Some of you may think I'm being too hard on Ruka. You may think she means no harm, and you might be inclined to take pity on her. But no matter how gullible and misinformed she is, she's no little girl. She's a grown woman who made a conscious decision to post this garbage. Your racism isn't backed by science, Ruka. It's born from your ignorance and small-minded fear. Bigots are among the last people I feel any sympathy for. You have the tools to educate yourself on the facts in defiance of your pathetic worldview. Instead, you've chosen to be a savage.